that's Jardine Matheson building. This is where your great-grandfather would have worked. Matthew has enlisted the help of local historian, Kim Taylor. Jardine Matheson was the first to acquire territory on the Bund. This is as tanky as you can get in terms of Shanghai real estate. So this is prime real estate. And that shield on the top, was that, was that the kind of Jardine Matheson crest? Yes, but it's been defaced during the Cultural Revolution. Oh, so any, any... Any, sign, any symbol of imperialism was taken down. taken down, yes. David Landale and his family lived a life of luxury in the international settlement. A keen horseman, David owned a stable of racehorses and enjoyed a whirlwind of social events. Shooting parties, tennis, and boat trips upriver. But there was a darker side to life in Shanghai, permeated by opium. The municipal council David Landale chaired collected revenue from businesses within the international settlement, including its 1,500 opium houses, or dens. By 1907, addiction had become an increasing source of concern for the Chinese authorities. Dr. Wong Li Cheng is an expert on the opium trade. He's saying that it wasn't very expensive, that just ordinary people could buy it, and that in the beginning, when you first start using opium, you, you get a high from it, you feel very happy, yeah. but then it becomes addictive, yeah. and after a long period of use, it becomes debilitating. And, and are there any ideas, are there any accurate numbers about the number of people involved, or the percentage of the population, or...? 他说在一八三九年的时候,西亚片的大概是二百万人. Two million people in 1839, approximately. 大概是两二千万,十倍,两千万. This had increased tenfold by 1906. So it could be 20, 20 million. million. Yeah, 20 million by 1906. The Chinese put increasing pressure on the municipal council to shut down opium houses in the international settlement. Dr. Wong shows Matthew the formal request the Chinese government made to David Landale's council. This is when the Chinese government is saying that they hope that over a period of 10 years, opium can be completely eradicated, eradicated and that over the 10 years, every year, one-tenth of the opium houses closed down. Okay. So, of course, the international settlement was crucial in this, implementing this policy. But shutting down 1,500 opium houses would be a serious drain on the municipal council's income. It collected more revenue in fees from opium houses than from any other source apart from rickshaws. The revenue funded everything from the tram lines to the police force. The business leaders on the council wouldn't welcome any disruption to the smooth running of the settlement. David Landale was dealing with an extremely tricky political issue, one that the British government was now keen to see resolved before it could do damage to the diplomatic relationship with China. Kim has located the council records in the old Jesuit library. David Landale, in his attempt to handle this problem, you mm. know, he's hopping and skipping between all these yeah, different groups. Yeah, trying to keep everybody happy. Exactly. We see here that they actually do um, stamp out a quarter of the opium houses in Shanghai. Oh, so they're is, actually listed. I mean, it's actually listed. Of... They had a drawer. It was like... In the marketplace, they literally lottery. had a lottery, and they pulled out um, X number of um, licenses, and these were the shops that had to close. Really? So it was done at random, and this, they list it out here. Well, you know, we've got the addresses, the, the actual number of the license house, the rate, 
And then here we can see that 369 houses were actually shut down and the loss of income was $1,692. So David Landale did comply with the Chinese request rescinding a quarter of all opium house licenses. But he needed to find a way to make up the loss of income. The answer still lay with opium. The municipal council collected fees from not only opium houses, but also opium shops, which sold the drug for private use. And here you can see how cleverly David Landau actually um, handled the figures. By 1909, we have 301 opium houses and 232 opium shops. Yeah. And the income has just about balanced out. So basically everything's turning from an opium house into an opium shop, like a, a place where you can smoke it to a place where you can buy it. You can at least buy it and take it home and privately smoke it. So where he lost in the rent for licenses, for opium houses, he made up in the rent to opium shops. Mm. And in the end, he, um, yeah. Kept both sides of the argument happy. He's, he's a sharp operator. David Landale retired to Scotland in 1919. His term in Shanghai had seen the beginning of the end of legal opium use. By the 1920s, full prohibition forced the drug underground. The communist takeover in 1949 pushed foreign businesses out of China. Jardine Matheson withdrew to its headquarters in Hong Kong. This hasn't been an easy trip for me in Shanghai. I was really worried to begin with what I might find. In the end, looking back, I think David Landale would be surprised at our fascination with the opium trade. 